Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation on an important episode in U of M's history and in the history of higher education, as it's captured in the book, Conquering Heroines, How Women Fought Sex Bias at Michigan and Paved the Way for Title IX. Our guest tonight is Sarah Fitzgerald, and I'm Gary Krenz. Before introducing Sarah, I want to say as the, as the archives of the University of Michigan, the Bentley Library acknowledges that the historical origins and present locations of the university were made possible by cession of lands by Anishinaabe and Wyandotte peoples under coercive treaties common in the colonization and expansion of the United States. We note in particular the grant of land made by the Anishinaabe under the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids for the college at Detroit so that their children could be educated. These lands continue to be the homeland of indigenous people, and we seek to reaffirm and respect their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and to recognize their contributions to the university. Now, a lot of people know what Title IX is, or at least know, uh, have some sense of its importance in this nation's work, its, its ongoing work, to address discrimination against women, and more recently, by extension, transgender individuals, uh, particularly for our purposes uh, in education and related activities. Perhaps less well known are the, is the executive order that preceded it, and the work of some very dedicated women activists to leverage that order into real change in the academic world. A crucial part of that effort played, right out, played out right here at the University of Michigan, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. We are privileged to have with us Sarah Fitzgerald, author of this marvelous account of this episode in Michigan and American history. Sarah was in fact editor-in-chief of the Michigan Daily during much of this, uh, the first woman to hold that role, so she helped record this history firsthand and now she has returned to it from the long view. Sarah is an award-winning author of both fiction and nonfiction. After graduating from University of Michigan with a major in history and journalism, she spent most of her career as a journalist, including 15 years at the Washington Post, where she served as editor and new media developer. She's, she is the author of Ellie Peterson, Mother of the Moderates, which the Library of Michigan named a notable book in 2012, and more recently of The Poet's Girl, a novel of Emily Hale and T.S. Eliot. So Sarah, it's a real pleasure to welcome you and to have you join us here, and please uh, lead us on this journey. Well, thanks, Gary, and thank all of you for joining uh, us here tonight. And uh, let me see if I can get my uh, screen uh, great. Um, as Gary said, Conquering Heroines tells a story that unfolded on college campuses in the early 1970s and most notably at University of Michigan. It was a time I lived through and I thought it was important to capture the story before it was lost to history. This, okay, let's try it now. I'm not advancing. Okay, thanks folks for being patient. We got a little little technical uh, technical glitch. Um, There we, go. there we go. Okay. Sorry Great. about that. The story actually begins at the University of Maryland, where a woman named Bernice Sandler had just earned a doctorate in psychology in 1969. Her department was then expanding and hiring new faculty members, and she was frustrated when she was passed over for one of those jobs. She went to a friendly colleague to find out what the problem was. He replied, let's face it, you come on too strong for a woman. Shortly after that, a researcher spent most of her job interview explaining to Sandler that he couldn't hire a woman when she had children because if they got sick, she would need to stay home with them. By that point, Sandler's children were teenagers. Then a counselor at an employment agency looked at her resume and said she was not really a professional, but just a housewife who went back to school. Sandler had never heard the term sex discrimination but she felt she had been the victim of an injustice and she set out to find a remedy. 
She was shocked to learn that academic women had been excluded from the protections of the key civil rights laws of the 1960s, largely to secure passage of the legislation. But one day she was reading a report by the US Commission on Civil Rights, and she turned to the back to check out a footnote. It explained that in 1967, President Johnson had expanded a Kennedy era executive order that barred federal contractors from discriminating on the basis of race to now include sex discrimination. She described it as a eureka moment because she realized that every major US university was a federal contractor and that this would give university women the tool that they needed to challenge the discrimination they were then encountering on their campuses. But Sandler wanted to make sure she had interpreted this correctly. So she called the labor department and eventually was transferred to a lawyer named Vincent Macaluso who was deputy director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance. He told Sandler, I've been waiting for somebody to call me. Behind the scenes, he coached her on how to pursue her complaint. But because he was a civil servant, it was several years before Sandler could reveal the role he had played in helping her. Certainly, we didn't know about it at the time. On January 31st, 1970, Sandler filed the first of the dozens of complaints she would eventually lodge against U.S. College, this one against her alma mater, the University of Maryland. She did it under the umbrella of a professional women's organization called the Women's Equity Action League. Macaluso told her it would help if she had a title, so she signed the complaint as chairman of WHEEL's Action Committee on Federal Contract Compliance. She later acknowledged that it was a committee of one. As I began working on my book, I was struck by an interesting historical parallel. Two days before Sandler filed her complaint, women testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee to oppose President Nixon's nomination of G. Harold Carswell to the Supreme Court. This marked the first time a potential Supreme Court nominee was opposed on the basis of the positions he had taken in a case involving sex discrimination. Like a handful of later nominations to the court, the Carswell nomination galvanized women to organize at the grassroots level to oppose the nomination. They included a small group in Ann Arbor who were friends of a, of a Democratic activist named Jean King. King had earned bachelor's and master's degrees at Michigan and had worked in a variety of clerical jobs around the university. In her 40s and with three children at home, she became one of only 10 women to earn law degrees in the Michigan Law School's class of 1968. As women were finding their voices in early 1970, King traveled to New York for the organizational meeting of a new professional women's caucus. There she met Sandler and learned about her strategy for challenging universities. King returned to Ann Arbor and got her friends in focus to agree to let her bring a complaint against Michigan using the organization's name. King had several advantages that women on other campuses did not. She was no longer an employee or student at Michigan, so the university couldn't retaliate against her. She was also savvy about politics and media coverage, and she worked hard to get support from members of Congress and sympathetic journalists. It's important to understand what the University of Michigan was like back in 1970. Although women were first admitted in 1870, Michigan's early culture was much more like the all-male schools of the Ivy League. It was not until 1954 that women could enter the Michigan Union through the front door, and not until 1968 that women were permitted in the build, billiards room there. In 1970, women could still not play in the Michigan marching band. The cheerleaders were all male. While dogs had just been permitted on the floor of Michigan Stadium, women and children were still barred. Although the Science Research Club was founded in 1902, female faculty members still could not join it. My freshman year, 1969 to 70, was one of the most volatile eras in university history, starting with a sit-in and arrest to achieve a student-run bookstore moving on to protest against the Vietnam War and culminating in March 1970 with the Black Action Movement strike. That resulted in the region setting a goal of increasing the percentage of Blacks in the student body from 3.5% to 
The complaint that Gene King masterminded was an equally important milestone, even if it was not as visible as some of the other protests that took place that academic year. Gene King knew how the aspirations of women and minorities had often collided over the course of American history. She later said that if the BAM strike had not been resolved that spring, she would not have filed her complaint because she did not want the university to set up blacks and women to compete against each other. King was secretly supported by psychology professor Elizabeth Duvan, then one of the highest ranking women faculty members who lent her statistical expertise to preparing the complaint. She was also helped by Kathleen Shortridge. The graduate student had researched the problem of campus sex discrimination for a seminar in investigative journalism and published her lengthy findings in a feature in the daily. In Shortridge's story, admissions officials openly acknowledged that for my class, the class of 1973, they had imposed a quota of 55% men and 45% women. It turned out that in the 1960s, the percentage of women admitted to the freshman class had been growing because on average, they had better grades and test scores than their male counterparts. Admission officials had feared that if the trends continued, there would be what one of them told Shortridge might be an overbalance of women in the student body. The focus complaint pointed out that of 900 professors in the university's largest unit, the College of Literature, Science and the Arts, only 34 were women. Across the university, only 6.6% .6 of professors were women. But if you excluded the School of Nursing, that number dropped to 5.3%. Even in other disciplines like education that had traditionally attracted more women, only six out of the 100 professors in that school were women. But the complaint went beyond the classroom. Michigan actually employed more women than men in non-teaching roles, but they were relegated to the lowest paying jobs. Many of these women also complained that they were expected to do the work of managers and business professionals, but were not being compensated for it. The university viewed many of them simply as student wives who would soon be moving on when their husbands found faculty positions at other colleges. King recruited Mary Yord, a Republican feminist whose late husband had been a law school administrator, to co-sign the complaint, which was formally filed in late May 1970. Following Sandler's strategy, they sent copies to the media first to throw university officials off guard. They also enlisted the help of members of Congress. The Labor Department ultimately bumped the complaint to what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Both cabinet departments changed secretaries that summer, and every time there was a change, the women would send a new round of letters to members of the Michigan congressional delegation. By the time they were done, they had sent more than 80 letters, this in the day before word processing software and email. That summer, Elliot Richardson was nominated to the first of his four cabinet posts as secretary of HEW. One of the key questions I wanted to pursue in my book was the extent to which university presidents had lobbied Richardson to get him to relax his department's enforcement efforts. Fortunately, Richardson donated most of his official papers to the Library of Congress, so I was able to review these interactions. One of my happy discoveries was that Richardson had had his secretary keep transcripts of all of his phone calls. For my project, it was rather like discovering the existence of the Nixon tapes. Over the summer of 1970, Sandler helped Congresswoman Edith Green stage several days of congressional hearings to bring the problem of sex discrimination to light. By then, Sandler had helped to file complaints against about 100 universities. The transcripts of the hearings were widely distributed, and Sandler said that they did more than anything else to make discrimi sex discrimination in education a legitimate issue. That August, HEW sent an investigative team to Michigan. Here, the chief investigator, Clifford Minton, second from left, is shown in a happy photograph shot by the university's public relations department. King alerted Helen Fogel of the Detroit Free Press, and she cornered Minton as he was leaving his hotel room. Based on his quotations, King complained to HEW officials and members of Congress 
that Minton did not really understand the nature of campus sex discrimination because he had spent most of his career addressing racial discrimination in other settings. HEW agreed to send another team to investigate. One of the team members was a young lawyer named Esther Larden, who later taught at the Georgetown University Law School and was a pioneer in the world of pro bono law. In an oral history about a decade ago, Lardent recalled that she was appalled by what she and her fellow investigators had found at Michigan. Quote, I don't think any of us sort of realized how intense this was, how accepted it was, how widespread it was. Women were clearly not taken seriously. They were not viewed as peers. What we would do is literally go through people's credentials and the credentials would be identical to a man and they would be seen as second rate or innately presenting problems and obstacles and that sort of thing. It was exciting because this had never been done before. We literally created the model for how the review went. Women were there in greater numbers and women were applying in greater numbers. And it was just a different kind of discrimination, but it had an intensity to it that was very strong. When I thought about doing civil rights work, I had always thought about it in terms of race. We have such a horrible history that is pernicious and lingering to this very day, obviously, racism in this country. But there was a kind of viciousness about this that was really disturbing, unquote. Two months later, in October 1970, HEW told the university that its team had found wide ranging instances of sex discrimination. Among other things, it found that the admission of women to doctoral programs lagged behind the numbers who had earned master's degrees, and the number of women being hired as faculty lagged behind the number who had earned doctorates. It also found many instances in which universities' anti-nepotism rules had served to discriminate against women whose husbands were also faculty members. HEW told President Fleming that if the university did not respond appropriately within 30 days and amend its existing affirmative action plan to include women, then HEW would begin withholding federal contracts. A month later, HEW made good on that threat. King and her supporters were thrilled when the federal agency got tough, but they were disappointed that the first contract to be withheld was one that was supposed to provide family planning consulting services to the government of Nepal. More so than many universities, the University of Michigan did acknowledge that HEW had found evidence of sex discrimination, but it refused to release those findings, which angered many women on campus at the time. Further, as secretaries began leaking their bosses' mail, it became known that university presidents around the country were working together to lobby top HEW officials to get them to relax their demands. As the end of 1970 approached, more federal contracts were jeopardized. Although it was not disclosed at the time, it appears that at least some U of M officials were worried about the catastrophic effect that withholding more contracts could have on the college's financial position. They ultimately accepted most of HEW's demands but continued to argue that HEW had no jurisdiction over graduate school admissions because graduate students should not be considered employees. Robin Fleming was then nationally recognized as a college president for the way he had successfully mediated student protests. There is some evidence that Michigan wanted to be the test case for HEW because officials were concerned that another college might be too willing to give in to the department's demands. One thing that Fleming did do was create a commission on women, which annoyed activists like Jean King because Fleming chose all the members and it was viewed as mere window dressing to placate HEW. But over time, the commission became an instrument for identifying problems on campus and addressing them. Its first chairman here in the foreground was Barbara Newell, a close aide to Fleming who went on to become president of Wellesley and later chancellor of the Florida State University system. Newell was a key player in all of um, these activities. And so I was thrilled to be able to interview her two years ago when she passed through Northern Virginia as she was about to celebrate her 90th birthday. I don't want to give away the whole book, but suffice it to say that it is filled with both inspiring stories and some very sad ones. 
There were several women faculty members who filed individual complaints, but were rebuffed by the mostly all male faculty committees that still controlled their departments. Several of these women left Michigan in frustration and many of their marriages broke up. Some of them became academic superstars at colleges in other parts of the country. Title IX was passed in 1972. Edith Green encouraged feminists not to lobby for the legislation so no one would notice what it was going to do. It took a while for people to realize what impact the law could have, particularly on college sports, and HEW did not get around to issuing the regulations to implement the new law until 1978. Even after the HEW complaint and the passage of Title IX, change did not happen overnight at Michigan. It was 15 years after the complaint before the University of Michigan appointed a woman vice president. It would be 20 years before the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts appointed its first woman dean, Edie Goldenberg. Eventually, Michigan named its first woman president, Mary Sue Coleman, and there was a time when a majority of the Board of Regents were women. By 2008, women earned a majority of doctoral degrees in the United States, and in 2017, American women surpassed men in the numbers attending law and medical schools, including those units at Michigan. But salaries still lag, and sadly, sexual harassment remains a problem at Michigan and elsewhere. As I went back to explore this time, I realized how grateful I was to have attended the University of Michigan during these years. I was inspired by these women and became friends with some of them. It was during those four years that Ms. Magazine was founded, the Equal Rights Amendment cleared Congress, the National Women's Political Caucus was founded, and the Supreme Court issued its decision in Roe v. Wade. When I graduated in 1973, I was filled with the conviction that I could be whatever I wanted to become. Through my research on this book and my earlier biography of Ella Peterson, I was happy to reconnect with Jean King when I returned to Ann Arbor. I was pleased that 40 years after the HEW complaint, she was able to attend a panel held at the Daily where women like me could talk to student journalists about the careers that we had been able to pursue. Jean was still angry that when Robin Fleming wrote his memoir, he reflected on the BAM strike and the anti-war protests, but made no mention of this particular battle. I know it was important to her that the story be told. Sadly, Jean died in early October at the age of 97. I hope that my book can be a testament to her and all the other conquering heroines who helped pave the way for women like me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's that was really a a, a great a great dive into the book, uh, uh, and a, a compact story, uh, compacting into into a, into a great story. Uh, just so much that uh, there's so much more in the book, as you as you alluded to. I want to I want to start just by asking the question about uh, about why Michigan. Um, uh, there were there were a lot of compl complaints filed. But as you point out, uh, Michigan was really sort of a, a major test case. And you mentioned in your remarks that maybe, maybe Robin Fleming wanted it, wanted it to be Michigan so that we weren't, you know, controlled by a case decided elsewhere. But you also reflect on other possible reasons. And I wonder if you could say, say a little bit about why Michigan in particular uh, ended up at the heart of this, uh, at the heart of this, this moment. Well, HEW was really overwhelmed by the number of complaints. They didn't really have the staff to investigate um, them all. And so there was some thought um, that they focused a lot of their efforts on Harvard and on University of Michigan. And at the time, Michigan was obviously a major public university. And at the time, I think it had the largest volume of federal contracts of any public university. It was a time uh, when a lot of defense contracts, uh, uh, work was being done for the Defense Department during the Vietnam War and, and science 
uh, contracts and that sort of thing. Um, at Harvard, and it, this again was was one of the things that um, was of a concern to the university presence, sort of depending on which region of the country you were in, um, these Office of Civil Rights bureaucrats could go after it a little bit differently. And in Harvard, they became to be much more focused on race discrimination there. Um, and uh, some contracts were threatened at Harvard, but it was really more over the issue of uh, the university giving access to their personnel systems and providing the kind of data that HEW wanted to analyze. So Michigan became, in effect, the first school where a contract was held up for sex discrimination. And a lot of people who were observing things at the time uh, felt that HEW thought if we can bring Michigan to the table, um, a lot of other colleges will follow suit. And, uh, you know, Fleming certainly at the time was a, a leading university president. He was appearing on Meet the Press and he was on the President's Commission on Campus Unrest. And so he had a fairly high profile. Um, one of the little interesting things when you're digging into papers, you sometimes find tidbits that surprised you. And um, someone, Harvard changed uh, presidents right around that time. And uh, somebody suggested Fleming as a nominee for that job. And he laughed and he said, oh, Harvard's never going to pick somebody other than one of its own. And uh, so he was <laughs> flattered to be considered, but did not take it very seriously. That's great. Thank you. So so you mentioned, you know, so the, I mean, you just mentioned again that, uh, uh, you know, there was also a lot of focus on race, uh, obviously, at this time and racial discrimination. Uh, and uh, you, 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 you say, you know, you, you, you paint this picture in the book uh, where, in effect, uh, People, I mean, the, the, the U of M administration, HEW, in a lot of ways, they're, they're having a much easier time getting their head around racial discrimination. They're having a very difficult time getting their uh, head sort of around uh, uh, discrimination on, on the basis of sex. And it really took a lot of perseverance for these women to kind of break through a mindset. And I wonder if you could, I wonder if you could say a little bit about that, that, that particular contrast. Well, as we noted, the, the first um, executive order dealt with uh, racial discrimination by federal contractors. And in the mid 60s, uh, before I came to Michigan, um, Michigan was subject to uh, compliance reviews regarding uh, race. And Walter Green, who later believed became deputy mayor of Detroit, uh, was uh, sent as a investigator for the Defense Department and, and wrote some uh, tough reports about that Michigan was really a school for wealthy white kids. And um, Fleming arrived right in the heels of the Detroit riots in 67. And, and so he and uh, Newell, who came then as his executive assistant, when they first arrived, they actually um, put a lot of effort into going around to departments and talking about this problem. The undercurrent was in some ways similar to what evolved uh, when they thought about sex discrimination. And there was a lot of hand wringing about, oh, we'd have to lower our standards to try to improve the number of you know, faculty members uh, who were persons of color. Um, and in the same way, they started saying, oh, we'd have to lower our standards to, to go find some women to hire kind of thing. So you know, that was very similar. Uh, but there was, um, I think, you know, a different mindset in, in terms of, you know, Fleming sort of used a word, a phrase that infuriated people to say it was a market choice that women weren't being hired. And I think I realized again, when I was working on this, that uh, Robin Fleming was born the same year my father was. And I think um, it was a generational thing of, of, you know, the roles of men and women. And even though, you know, Fleming's mother had worked when he was growing up and his wife worked for a while, I think before she had kids, um, it was not thought to be this is the normal role, you know, for women. And um, so they viewed it as quite different problems. And in fact, I mean, they are different problems. They have, you know, different issues involved. But, um, you know, and, and so as, as noted in the book, they often said some outrageous things because they viewed the problems very differently. Yeah, so some of the uh, some of the some of the, the things that were said uh, in in this in this culture that's just absolutely dominated by men, uh, and uh, frankly, a lot of the uh, a lot of the comments show men coming across as just a bit befuddled uh, by all of this, kind of just really not getting uh, what's going on. And you know, now we have Me Too, right, which uh, which shows that there there's still a lot of this, right. Um, 
Uh, but some of the things are quite, you know, just really quite uh, derogatory and demeaning comments that uh, that were found in these files, but that men were sort of tossing off uh, in an offhanded way. I mean, can you can you say can you elaborate on that a little? Bit? Well, and, and going back to this story, um, it was fascinating to dig into the archives at the Bentley Library. Enough years have passed that you can read all these things and read communications between department chairmen and, and, you know, deans of LSNA and, um, you know, people making the, you know, again, how they talked about women and their qualifications. And, um, you know, the thing that was, you know, perhaps most concerned or terrible were these women who had met their husbands um, when they were graduate students and they were both trying to get jobs and the, the male would be offered a professorship and the woman was told, well, you can come here, but you're going to have to go find the research grants and you know put your salary together and we'll try to do what we can for you in a few years. And the years would go by and, and they wouldn't see it happening and, and they would get very frustrated. And you know, they, they would have at the time, and it is one thing HEW focused on, anti-nepotism policies that people used as excuses not to, to promote women. And um, so it became difficult for many of them, and several of them brought individual complaints. And uh, you were still up against, you know, the departmental committee, you know, rejecting your promotion. Mm -hmm. And the nepotism, the nepotism policy was something that actually was changed pretty, pretty quickly as a result of the, as a result of this action. Well, it was one of the things HEW yeah. pointed to specifically. And, mm -hmm. you know, the university sort of said, well, we never meant for the policy to be interpreted that way, but departments, you know, certainly were. And, um, you know, they would find ways to get around it. Sometimes, you know, they, they would, say to one department, we'll hire your wife if you'll hire ours. And and there were um, some women who found positions in the residential college, which was then in its early days, and, um, you know, sort of considered, you know, not the regular university, I think, in some ways. Um, you know, so they there were ways that, you know, women got jobs, but not on the kind of basis that they wanted them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another thing back then, there, it was so isolating for women. If you were the only woman in your department, um, who did you go talk to? And uh, when women started after the HEW complaint, the Women's Commission and just that kind of changing tenor on campus um, started talking to each other and, and learning about each other's problems and realizing I'm not the only one who has this problem. I think it, it became very empowering for them and they started to learn how to network better. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Robin Fleming saying that uh, the issue here had to do with women's choices, the market choice. Uh, not with discrimination. Of course, we don't discriminate, but this is people are ending up uh, in the in the kinds of positions that they that they choose to be in. Uh, the university also took the tack with uh, HEW uh, that you know universities are different. We're different from industry. We're different from the government. We're really highly decentralized when it comes to hiring. We have these disciplinary structures that that uh, really uh, control the hiring and salary processes. And HEW just didn't have any, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't buy that at all, right? And neither, of course, would the women uh, on campus who were working on this. Um, so, can you say a little bit about how that played out? Because it, 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 it's, a, it's a recurring theme, it seems, in the, in the, in the, in this process. Well, HEW was viewing it um, more as viewing the university as, I mean, in some ways, a large manufacturer, which it was. And one of the things the Women's Commission, as they started delving into these problems, uh, realized pretty quickly is that there's a side of the university that is like a large corporation, all the administrative side and the side that's non-academic, which, um, as I noted before, women actually, you know, outnumbered men in that. And so there were some things that were pretty easy to fix um, that they implemented um, in a review and they brought in professionals to um, evaluate salary classification. So you actually would be more like the government in terms of your advancement path and that people would be treated more equitably across the university in those kinds of jobs. They started to put in place um, rules about that you had to advertise an opening so that people could have a chance to compete for it if they worked in another department uh, rather than it just, you know, the old boys mm -hmm. network at work. 
Um, and they tried to do some of those things on the academic side. They, they started, for instance, to say departments had to advertise openings. Now, they always came back and said, you know, we're looking for a very specific thing. It's just, you know, if I'm in Asian studies, I can't just hire any old professor in Asian studies. I'm looking for a Chinese language specialist and all. And, you know, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but they still said, you've got to do this. You've got to go to the professional societies. You've got to, you know, make it a more open competition rather than, again, the good old boys just picking their friends. Um, so as they started to work on these, they, um, and, you know, human resources and, and these things became uh, more sophisticated. They realized at some point that the problems of the academic side were very different than the uh, non-academic side. And it, and it led more to the Women's Commission um, dividing off and they formed an academic women's caucus um, that was in place for a number of years to focus on their uh, particular kinds of problems. And I think some of those you know, problems, still the nature of university hiring um, persist. I had an interesting, I, I came back uh, in 2019 to speak at a program uh, put on by the Center for the Education of Women, now CEW Plus. Mm -hmm. And I stayed around. And at the end of the day, we had kind of a roundtable discussion about university hiring practices. And a woman who was uh, involved with a small institute at the university, she said, oh, we have to go through so many levels of review to hire somebody that we often lose a good candidate to private industry because they can move so much more quickly. And I said, well, you got to understand that all those levels of review are in place because of 50 <laughs> years ago, that wasn't the way it was done. And everybody was just hiring their buddy or people didn't have a chance to compete for jobs. Right. So of course the pendulum can swing to one extreme or the other. But Yeah. Well, so many, so many of those different ways, the, the, some of those things we now take for granted, like, like the, uh, like the posting of jobs, uh, like uh, uh, the publication of salaries, which came along Along a little bit, a uh, little bit later, uh, but that uh, certainly uh, contributed to greater transparency, which allows people then to get a better sense of what's uh, of what's actually uh, actually going on. Um, I wonder if you could say so. You, you, this is again maybe a difference with some of the other activism that was on campus at the time. Um, uh, you know, there were certainly there were the there was the BAM movement. Uh, there were there were protests. These were you know a lot of the activism on the campus was fairly aggressive and very public. Uh, and you write this, uh, you said that Focus, the, the on the on-campus organization, had launched a hand grenade onto a battlefield that Fleming knew well. But unlike his earlier confrontations with student demonstrators, this attack featured no rallies, no crowded regents meetings, and no outside agitators or police clad in riot gear. Still, it was a form of guerrilla warfare. And you know, you certainly lay out a lot of a lot of strategy and tactics that were employed here. But I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on uh, on that idea of this being guerrilla warfare. Well, it went on in two levels. Um, the focus complaint was done uh, by a handful of women who worked together uh, somewhat clandestinely in terms of how they pulled their information together. And again, the idea of uh, we're not going to we're going to let the press call the university and and ask them about it rather than sending it to the university. That was a tactic to throw the administration um, off guard and, you know, have them, it's kind of like, you know, what happens in a lot of trials these days, if you're suing somebody, you, you know, you don't send it to the person, you let the press call the, the, the corporation or whatever, and, you know, put them off guard. Um, the, the, the other guerrilla aspect was picked up uh, by a group called Probe, uh, which was much more than uh, the case with Focus, was more a grassroots movement um, that kind of took place um, throughout that year on the Michigan campus of women, um, and largely women who were employed by the university or grad students, not so much um, the younger activists or people you know my age who were going around and doing protests. But these were women who were becoming concerned about a lot of their employment-related issues. And um, you know, it was a time when people were starting to hold consciousness raising groups and, and small groups. There were there were many uh, groups on the Michigan campus of one sort or another. About the only one that, that did 
really protests were, was the call for better child care at the university, which I think is still a problem. And at one point, um, some of the women staged, I think it was called a child in at the regents meeting where they all brought their babies and toddlers to crowd their room to make the point of the university should be providing us with a place to take our children. And it was really a challenge to find a place where you could set up a, a child care center at the university, even though it was an obvious need. Now, these women who were in probe, um, they they did a lot of what I would say were also more guerrilla tactics. Um, and sometimes uh, in in consultation with Jean King, and, and she encouraged them, even as she sometimes worried that some of them were going to jeopardize their jobs by if they were too uh, publicly visible. But among the things they did is, um, you know, they really had a desire to communicate with campus women. They obviously didn't have any money. Uh, so what uh, King suggested they do is put um, their flyers on the inside of the doors of the women's bathrooms around campus. If you put it on a bulletin board, it was thought the administrator would come along and take it down because that was too subversive. But if you put it in the women's room, there were obviously no male administrators going in there. So that was an effective way to, to communicate. Another thing they did, and, and again, one of the things, and uh, Barbara Newell stressed this, in an interview with me is that, you know, the university at the time hardly even knew how many women worked for it. Their personnel uh, computer systems were still, you know, in the uh, early days. And so to even uh, tell HEW how many women uh, were at what level was a challenge. And one of the reasons, you know, Fleming tried to delay the response. Uh, but so what these women would do would sit down with staff directories and just start compiling the names of women. And at one point they wanted to send out a survey to, to find out what are women's you know, main concerns. And so they used the university mail system. And overnight there was this surge of mail. And when the administrator of the system saw it, he started opening some of the mail and then you know, decreed that this wasn't, you know, an illegal use of the mail system, but they were pleased that they did get some of them out and started to hear responses. Another, these women, they, they had a lot of fun together and they were very creative. And another thing they did was, um, this occurred a little bit later on in 1972, um, they became concerned that Robin Fleming wasn't meeting with women. And so they parked themselves outside of his office for a week and tracked how many women got in to see Robin Fleming. And uh, I think, you know, of like 145 people who were in the office that week, only like 21 were women and all but one of them uh, view, saw Fleming as part of a larger group. So um, they, you know, they came up with an amusing acronym for their group and they uh, uh, did up a report, but they said that, you know, to his credit, Fleming actually talked to them about the issue and, you know, seemed receptive that maybe this was something he should pay a little more attention to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and journalism was a big part of this, right? I mean, you mentioned uh, how, you know, putting, putting things out to the media before, uh, before the university. Uh, and Gene King was pretty savvy about uh, about getting getting media involved. Can you talk talk about that just a little bit? Well, it was also the time when women were stepping into more important jobs in journalism. And and at the Detroit Free Press, Eileen Foley and Helen Fogel, who had started there as like you know low paying action line type jobs, were starting to get to be real reporters. And it was also the time when the women's sections um, for and about women were changing from traditional fashion and society news to more substantive things. And so uh, those women were very eager to get their teeth into this story because it was something that they were dealing with in their own workplaces. And, um, you know, at the Daily, it being, uh, Jean would come over and, and she would, you know, tell about the latest thing that they thought was going on and try to get us to, you know, to pursue it. And sometimes when we made the calls as journalists, we could get answers about things. And, um, you know, so it was, uh, you know, but the other thing that helped is that women in, in congressional offices and university administrator offices started leaking things that you know, they were coming across. And in some cases, they said some of these women actually, you know, put their jobs in jeopardy by some of the things that, you know, they were sharing from their boss's mail. Thank you. I want to, before we turn to, to uh, uh, audience questions in just a minute, I would like to sort of uh, just talk a little bit about your experience with this. I mean, both, both then 
uh, with the daily, uh, and also in terms of writing the book. Um, and I guess just start by, you know, so how, 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 what, how does this difference feel? Looking at this now, sort of as a historian, versus looking at it as you did back then uh, from a journalistic perspective and somebody who was right there at the time. Well, it, it, to just go back and explain how I got interested in going back to this story, um, when I, uh, I when I wrote my Ellie Peterson book at the time, uh, being I live in the Washington area and uh, the Library of Congress, um, the the women who were sort of their staff specialists on women's history uh, would sponsor a, a monthly uh, brown bag lunch, and we'd uh, come and share our projects and um, you know resources that we knew about. And I went to one of those and they said, oh, by the way, today, Kitty Sklar is um, going to be talking on her new book about Florence Kelly over at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And Kitty had been my thesis advisor when I was a history major and I'd, I'd kept in touch with her, but hadn't really seen her for years. So I went over to the book signing and as uh, she was signing books, I got talking to her husband and um, the two of them were then the editors of a online uh, repository of documents about women's history with an eye to teaching students how to use original documents. And I was telling Tom Doolin about my time and Kitty's time back at Michigan. And on the way home, he sort of said, gosh, that sounds like a good story for our, our uh, project. And so they approached me and said, would you be willing to do this paper for us? So I, I dipped into it back in and published that in about 2013. And that got me into the archives and, and seeing these oral histories that had been done and, and some of the previous reports. And I knew at the time um, that 2020 would be the 50th anniversary of the complaint and the um, 150th anniversary mm -hmm. of mission of women to Michigan. And I thought, well, those are those are two good milestones to uh, try to to connect with. And so um, I contacted University of Michigan Press and was pleased when they were enthusiastic. And we did actually get it out in September of 2020. But of course, the <laughs> pandemic sort of interrupted some of our plans to mark the milestone in the ways we might. Have. Right, right. I, I understand. Uh, but, so, you know, I mean, just if, if yeah. the other side of your question was yeah. coming back differently to it. And, and, I, do, and I do think that having uh, been in Washington um, for most of my career, I really was very interested in the federal government side of the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, having more time to go back and say, this is an interesting strand that when you were living through it and it was fast moving, you never fully, um, you know, had the chance to pursue. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those things, just small one was to the department whose contract was held up was, did anybody care? Was this a source of, you know, concern? And, and uh, so to, to go back and read some of those archives was, was interesting too. Yeah. Did you find anything that really surprised you? Well, I think uh, you, you look at, probably the of, of age and experience or whatever, things are never as black and white as you may think they are when you're young. And um, I, I was sort of fascinated because, I mean, everybody was upset and it was pretty obvious that, you know, Fleming was distributing the report to other college presidents several weeks before he released it on campus and all of that correspondence uh, was there pretty blatantly. What I was surprised is I don't think they were very successful in lobbying um, Elliot Richardson, uh, in part because HEW was then an even bigger department than it is now. Education was only one of its component. And Richardson was getting into his job, hiring his cabinet people. He had lots of issues on his plate. He was very savvy about Congress and concerned about keeping Congress happy. And one of the things I thought was a delicious irony was that uh, Fleming was relying on a particular committee of college presidents who had Richardson's ear to go make the case. Well, one of them, Arthur Fleming, who was then the president of McAllister, it turned out he was quietly lobbying Richardson for a job because he was about to lose his job at McAllister. And so it was something that he didn't wasn't talking about at the time. And so that was an interesting little side bit that I had not known about at the time. Mm -hmm. So maybe one last question before we turn to the audience. And I want to just mention to the audience, please, um, you know, put questions into the into the comment uh, function there on YouTube and we'll, we'll pick them up. Uh, and I guess the question I would have is, so this was a really, this was, as you, as you point out, this was a, 
a, a pretty intense time at the University of Michigan. There was just a lot going on, a lot of upheaval, a lot of big questions being dealt with. Uh, it must have been uh, both sort of exciting and terrifying to be a reporter <laughs> or, or, or an editor, maybe, uh, in the midst of that. And what, what advice would you give to uh, a Michigan Daily editor or reporter today uh, when we also have some, some issues of, of significance um, burbling on the campus? Well, thinking back on this story generally, I, I was thinking that sometimes to dig down into the fine print, and you'll find interesting stories. Um, one point in my career, I was reading the Federal Register on a daily uh, basis, which can be a pretty boring document, but just as um, Bernie Sandler looked back and checked out the footnote and found the answer to her problem, it's, it's, it's like a lot of those things that can seem very boring on the surface if you dig down uh, more deeply can be uh, you know, pretty interesting. And I, th I think the other challenge, which is more so, say, for a, an organization like The Daily than, a, you know, traditional journalists, is um, we were moving on. And one of the things that was important to us is this story went on for many years and we weren't going to be around uh, to see the end of it. And I know that uh, we felt a strong commitment that we had to keep uh, training the next class into the nuances of this so that they would be able um, to track it after, you know, we were graduating and, you know, could no longer, you know, be around to pursue it ourselves. And I think, you know, again, it's a, it's, it's a sad thing. I think with journalism these days, local journalism is un, in particular is under challenge. And um, I think the institutional memory that a lot of no news organizations have is, it's not as long as it was, you know, back earlier in my career. And so I think those are concerns too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's see, we, ha we have uh, we have the first question from, from an audience member. Uh, let's, uh, since HEW doesn't exist anymore and hasn't existed as that particular entity for some time, uh, younger viewers of this talk may not know what you are referring to by using that acronym. So I guess we need to- I'm sorry <laughs> about that, yeah. Uh, Back then, it was Health Education and Welfare Department. And uh, in the Carter administration, uh, education was uh, uh, spun off as a separate department. And um, the what was then that part of HEW is the Health and Human Services Department. Um, it is still in charge of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those big issues, and Education Department now is in charge of the regulations that would um, you know, govern universities. Um, you know, I think in, it's still a little complicated in terms of who enforces um, this particular um, uh, executive order. And I was interested, um, I think about a year ago, um, a uh, lawyer in, in one of the regional offices of, um, I think the Office of Civil Rights, maybe within the Justice Department, but was enforcing the contract compliance requirements and forced both Princeton and Yale uh, to make adjustments for women faculty members who had complained about their, their salary situations. Mm -hmm. uh, not seeing anything else at the moment. Uh, maybe Laura will feed us something in just a minute. But, uh, but you know, so much of this is about, I mean, you, you, paint, you, you, you really uh, just do wonderful characterizations of so many people. Uh, in this book, um, and of course, at the center of it are are, are Jean uh, Jean King and uh, Bunny Sandler. Any anything to say about them to help us uh, just just know them a little better? Well, I was I felt privileged um, that I had obviously known Jean back in 1970, but excuse me, spent some time with her about 10 years ago, and I also. Uh, Bunny Sandler was also still then alive and lived in Washington area, so I got to interview her. And, um, you know, they, they had some similarities, actually. Jean was a little bit older. They both had um, strong role mothers, working mothers. Um, they, the parents encouraged them to, to go to college and get educated. Uh, Bunny Sandler actually had passed through Ann Arbor uh, at an earlier point in, in her career. They were both uh, small of stature. Uh, Bunny Sandler used to laugh at how journalists uh, would characterize her as feisty and, and, you know, I mean, there's some of these adjectives that are used when, when uh, 
Jean, I think the Ann Arbor News did a feature calling her sort of Ann Arbor's Bella Abzug, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we're Bella Abzug without a hat or something like that. So, but I think they both, um, they, they liked being in the spotlight. They worked, they were friends, they uh, communicated a lot. Bunny Sandler basically uh, built a career for herself as an advocate of women in education and, you know, became a consultant and well-known authority. And, and uh, Jean, meanwhile, developed a, a field of law. Uh, you know, she became one of the go-to attorneys for, uh, you know, pursuing, uh, particularly in areas of women's sports, um, to challenge, uh, you know, the opportunities for women. And uh, Jean once said that um, you know, her mother was a pretty good athlete. And as I said, Jean was short and I guess not particularly good at sports. But uh, she said, you know, it's important for women to have access to sports, not because we all need to be athletes, but she felt it was on the playing field that men had the chance to learn important skills like leadership, you know, teamwork, quarterbacking, whatever it was, and that they built those relationships. And until women had the same kind of experience, um, they were not, they were always going to be behind the eight ball in, in that respect. Uh, another one here. Uh, for months, U of M refused, uh, as you mentioned, to make public the uh, HEW findings, and women had to fight for, tra for, for that transparency. Uh, can you speak to that fight and how frustrating it was that U of M wasn't releasing the, the, the findings? Yeah, it was interesting because I think that, I mean, I think Fleming really wanted to control things. He wanted to uh, negotiate with HEW. And um, interestingly, you might think that HEW would release the findings to, to King and focus because they had brought the complaint, but it wasn't that kind of situation. The, the government officials view themselves as compliance reviewers and they needed to negotiate with the university. And Fleming made several mistakes, in my view, in terms of uh, how he managed it. And I think one was the lack of transparency because uh, that really angered women all over, you know, every end of the political spectrum and, um, you know, sort of radicalized would not, it would be an overstatement, but um, it troubled them that, uh, you know, they thought this was a pretty reasonable thing um, to share the information. Now, one answer was that the university itself didn't know the information because its personnel systems were so inadequate. Um, but, you know, they could have brought in uh, more women or, or, or sought help from knowledgeable women. I was actually surprised that he didn't give Barbara Newell a, a more important role at the time, uh, because I think she had some good ideas for how they could have responded to HEW that were sort of we can give them a little and continue to promise to work on this and position ourselves more favorably. Um, but, you know, they just sort of viewed this as a nuisance and, and federal bureaucrats run amok and that sort of thing, which they kind of dug in their heels. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, to comply with HEW, U of M established the Commission on Women uh, to help uh, field sex discrimination complaints. Uh, how did the commission op operate? Is it true that it could be easily overruled? Uh, and was it a was it a commission that uh, was had power in name only, or did it actually have some uh, some clout? I think over time um, it it became more effective. As I said, uh, Fleming uh, uh, made the first appointments, and of course, one of the challenges was. Uh, if you don't have a lot of women in leadership positions, it's hard to find women to be on these committees. And it's one of the, the uh, challenges for women who were faculty members at the time as they started to open up these committees. They were, you know, not able to devote as much time to their teaching work because they were too busy doing being asked to be on a university committee. I think that um, as the women started to talk and learn that um, a lot of them saw things differently. One was Harriet Mills, who was a professor in uh, Chinese studies and, and she was single. She didn't think childcare was a big problem, but as she listened to women talk about it, she realized it was really important. And, and, and she became a real advocate when she sort of began to understand how the university was not doing basic good personnel uh, practices in terms of advertising. I think over time, some of the original appointees uh, resigned or their heart really wasn't in it, and they did start 
to appoint women who were more focused um, mm -hmm. on it. And, and is, when I look at the period of time, um, particularly after beyond what the period covered my, by my book, I found that there were a lot of uh, strong uh, feminists who got on there. And I think that they, they tried to do uh, more, you know, they, they, in terms of authority, they could make recommendations, but I think that um, they spoke with a powerful voice. And uh, one of the things they did uh, in the first years was they did what were called cluster reports. And they went around to departments and tried to talk to women and gather um, you know, more information and educate the rest of the university about what was going on. Of course, in some departments, there were so few women that you couldn't really uh, write what the women had said because <laughs> it would be so obvious who was doing the talking. But, uh, you know, again, those are some of the things that, uh, um, and, you know, CEW changed its focus a little bit over time. It dropped mm -hmm. continuing, you know, education right. of women and became you know, focused on the main problems. And, and uh, right. you know, so all of those things help. Yeah, yeah. Let's take one last question, if you don't mind. Uh, you have seen, uh, it's a good one, I think. Uh, you have seen and been involved in so much. Can you comment on where you think we are in the arc of gender equality? <laughs> well, in, in the words of the Virginia Slims uh, uh, commercial, we've come a long way, baby. But I think, you know, the thing that's sort of challenging is it's 50 years, and I think we are still fighting some of these battles. And I, um, I, you know, we still haven't ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. I, I mentioned before I'm doing this uh, book about Ellie Peterson, and she was one of the leaders in the ratification campaign. And I uh, went down to the the, the Virginia uh, General Assembly has since uh, finally added its vote for ratification. But a few years ago, I went down there and I took my granddaughter in and we went to visit the legislator in whose district she lived. And I sat there and I thought, I am now older than Ellie Peterson was when oh. she was doing this. And that, you know, it was like deja vu all over again. And, and I think it just, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to do my book was to, um, you know, remind young women that, you know, these, you have to keep fighting these battles, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that, that, uh, that's maybe, maybe a great way to, uh, to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this. Um, I want to again say to the audience that uh, the book Conquering Heroines, is, it's really rich and thorough. Uh, and, uh, you know, I highly recommend it. I think that uh, it illuminates a lot of issues. I mean, obviously discrimination, uh, but activism and activist ta tactics and the possibilities of government as a force for justice and the politics behind, uh, you know, moving government in that way and just really, uh, uh, really great. And, and the humane depiction of so many people uh, who uh, and, and their lives as they intersected over this, uh, this issue. So thank you. Thank you so much for, for tonight. Uh, I want to thank Laura Zeelan uh, for her behind the screen support for the webinar and also the Michigan media team, which managed tonight's event. And thank you to the audience and for your questions. Uh, this session will be available on our website in about a week. Uh, there will not be a Making Michigan webinar in December, but I hope you will join us again in January. And please stay tuned uh, for more information about that. And until then, be safe uh, and stay well and good night. Thank you.